Uh, now, I hope no one will deny, I don't think anyone here will be denying, that materialism is actually pretty successful in um, giving us theories of the world that work. The trouble is that our theories of physics seem to ta start talking about things that, uh, in the everyday sense, seem quite nebulous fields or, or about how space and time might somehow be bootstrapped into existence from the relationships between particles. Meanwhile, we don't really understand quite where we fit into this, how consciousness and experience of qualities comes from quarks and photons. There's no way we can predict what people are going to think about this in 100 years from now, but is there any reason in the here and now to question whether materialism needs to be extended in some way? And is science the only arbiter of that question? Well, I'm delighted to introduce the speakers who are going to help us frame and think about these issues. On my right is Hilary Lawson. He's director of the Institute of Art and Ideas um, and of the How the Light Gets In Festival. First on my left is John Ellis, who is professor of theoretical physics at King's College London and a physicist at CERN. And on my far left is Susan Blackmore, who's a psychologist and visiting professor at the University of Plymouth. Has the materialist, materialist view been successful yet profoundly mistaken. And first off is Hilary. Thank you. So uh, materialism has a wonderful down-to-earth sort of quality to it um, by comparison with the seemingly rather mystical uh, notion of the immaterial and mind and consciousness and mind of God and so forth. But I think that materialism is just as fantastic a story as uh, immaterialism. Science has, from the outset, relied on the immaterial. So Newton, in his uh, initial framing of science, really kicking off contemporary science and providing the framework that is still used, of course, um, uh, relies on forces. Forces were, at the time when he first suggested this, he was criticized for being mystical and not sufficiently mechanical. He also relied on time and space. Uh, there's also mathematics, not obviously very material. Um, and the laws of the universe themselves, what are they? Where are they in this materialist universe? So from the outset, immater the immaterial has been embedded in science. And there are some materialists who've tried to get round this puzzle because they just don't like this. Uh, it's not sort of grounded enough. So they tried to get around this by expanding the idea of material to include all of these other things, to include time and space and, and mathematics and so forth. And, and um, uh, the problem with that is that if you I I extend material to include all of these things, it's no longer obvious what you mean by material at all. And I don't think you have any content to the term. So if the world isn't material, and incidentally, there's another problem, which is I think that, that the, a, a purely materialist account of the universe is incoherent because it can't give an account of where the materialist theory is itself. But just as an, uh, as an aside, really. So if, it's not, if the world's not material, what is it? Well, people have had you know, a variety of proposals. Uh, it's uh, mind. Um, as, as I say, some people have suggested it's mathematics. Uh, a, a recent uh, arrival on the block is uh, people are now saying it's information. Um, so people have had all sorts of ideas about what the world is, is made of. And uh, you can make a good case for all of them. You can develop the narrative. You can make a good case. Uh, it can sound plausible. But they all break down because they're human concepts. They're not the nature of the world. And what our concepts are doing and what our language is doing is not describing some ultimate reality. It's enabling us to do things in the world. They're tools to enable us to do things. And if you hold the world as uh, a material thing, then you build the world like that. And you try and make everything material. You, you operate within that closure, as I would argue. And within that closure, you create your system and um, you can do a pretty good job of it, but there are lots of bits of it that just don't work, that you can't quite make any sense of thought, you quite uh, make any sense of uh, uh, other areas of your, your overall account. If you instead you start with I immaterialism, you say the world is all mind, well, you know, there are some good people in the history of philosophy who's had a very good attempt to 
account for how the world could be all mind. Uh, so in each case, you can develop the closure. You can hold the world as if it's all material. You can hold the world as if it's all immaterial. You can hold the world as energy. You can hold the world as uh, mathematics. And as I say, some people are having a go at ha holding the world as information, which I have to say I don't think works very well. But nevertheless, um, th th they're plausible narratives. But they will always break down because they're not descriptions of reality. They're the tools we use to describe reality. And uh, that's why it's none of these things. We can't, with language, say what is the ultimate stuff of the universe. What we can do is we can hold the universe in all of these different ways and achieve different things with those different ways of holding it. Thank you. John, over to you. Yeah, well, uh, needless to say, I'm the, uh, the dummy who's a thoroughgoing materialist on this panel. As I said before, you know, my T-shirt, that describes the stuff in the universe. But actually, not, not all the stuff in the universe. But uh, I think in your introduction, you mentioned quarks and photons. And so, so, so they're in there, OK? Uh, there's some stuff which we don't yet know what it is, uh, stuff that we call dark matter. And uh, I like to joke that that's that <laughs> bit up there. Because <laughs> there's more of it. There's, yeah. there's a lot, lot more of it, yeah. <laughs> And uh, then we also talk about dark energy. I'm not sure whether dark energy qualifies as stuff or not. So, of course, what I have written on my T-shirt is going to be largely incomprehensible to, to most people in the audience, right? And that's because it's, it's written in a very mathematical language. And uh, so just to sort of point, make a, one point of contact with what uh, Hillary just said, uh, you know, mathematics for us materialists is a, is a tool for uh, describing or understanding or manipulating or using uh, knowledge of this stuff. Uh, so, you know, it, it is a, a tool that we use in our materialist description, although I certainly agree with, with, uh, with what Hillary said, that it's not actually material I in itself. Um, one interesting thing is that our, our our concept of what is material, I think, has evolved significantly in the uh, in the last century. So, uh, so, so Hillary talked, you know, for example, about uh, Newton, who I think had a rather different concept uh, of what is material from what you know, nowadays in the quantum mechanical world we, we see as, as material. And for example, uh, we now see a connection between particles and, and fields that uh, was uh, you know, un unknown to, to, to Newton. But of course, what's written on my T-shirt does not explain everything, right? And it's a very important aspect of our uh, materialist description of the universe, which is that the concept of emergence, that phenomena that emerge from the complicated interactions of what is, what, what is written on my T-shirt. OK, so, so this picture, I would claim, is very successful. I would claim it is not mistaken because it works. You know, it enables us to make you no know, mobile phones and uh, you no know, electric cars and so on and so forth. It's not mistaken, but I agree that it's limited. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure whether it really provides us with understanding. It provides us with description, and uh, as I commented in the previous debate, it it, it addresses questions like you know, what, where, when, and how, but not why. And, and I think this is one of the key shortcomings that Hillary is concerned about. Thank you. Over to you, Susan. Well, materialism, from the point of view of someone interested in, obsessed with consciousness, materialism has its obvious problem. It gives rise to the so-called hard problem of consciousness. How does subjective experience arise from objective activities in a brain? I think it's a misposed question because ultimately we have to get rid of this duality. Materialism can't account for subjective experience and idealism can't account for the, the, the material world at all easily. Can experience in any way, practicing different experiences to look into the nature of the universe, help at all? Well, here's my adventures at the moment. I would say I'm a bit obsessed. I'm glad to be invited on this panel because I'm a bit obsessed in an ignorant, exploring kind of way about the stuff of the universe. So one thing I, I tend to do, this time of year, it would be in my greenhouse late at night. I've been working hard all day, like the song goes, and it sure, sure gets stoned at night. And I um, have a spliff and sit there and start 
thinking. Now, one of the ways this will go will be, okay, do that meditation thing I'm used to, drop duality. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists very much. Thank you all.